number of eminent painters of the Puget Sound area have drawn special inspiration from the Northwest. The oyster shell light, the changing colors of its waters, and the evasive mountains. One of these painters was Mark Toby, and it was not surprising then that as a friend of Arthur and Virginia Barnett, he found his way to their home on Bainbridge Island for frequent visits. His presence is still felt in the Barnett's collection of his paintings, drawings, and prints that grace their home. Through the years, they have enjoyed sharing their artwork and stories about the artists with friends and neighbors who have come to visit. The Schaefers, who live across the bay, have persuaded Arthur and Virginia to document on video their experiences of a cherished and long-standing friendship with Mark Toby. Well, I met uh, Toby in the latter part of the 1940s when he was rec recommended uh, by Morris Graves. He telephoned me for a an appointment to discuss his income tax problems. And he needed some advice. And um, an interesting incident that came up at the end of the year when he came in and said, how much do I owe you for the work you did for me? Well, and I gave him an estimate. He said, do you want a check or do you want a painting? Well, I took the check. And when I come home that evening, I said, to Virginia, Mr. Toby was in and asked me the question and I took a check. Well, I never heard the end of that. <laughs> Virginia knew more about him and his reputation than I did, obviously. So the next year when I did a job and he came in, I said, don't ask me that question again. What question? Do I want a check or do I want a painting? So I told him about the response of Virginia. And he laughed himself and said, all right, I'll call Seligman, who was his local gallery representative, and have him set something aside. So that's the little relaxed deer that he sketched at Woodland Park that's in the hallway. For some particular reason, he used to want to talk to me uh, in the mornings. He'd call up. Uh, after having been at his studio from 6 o'clock in the morning, they'd call me about 7.30. They wanted to meet me, and he'd pay for the breakfast at Manning's Breakfast Store, which was very famous on University Way. And he did talk about things. He just wanted somebody to talk to. And sometimes he was very discouraged. And sometimes he would ask me questions, and I'd say, Well, uh, Toby, I don't know anything about art. What, why do you ask me this? Well, he said, I know you don't know anything about art, but I want your reactions. Yeah. Oh, and I can remember, he was very low about things. And I said, well, if it's any news to you, my wife thinks you're about the best of the United States. <laughs> that was about the way I put it. So about a year later, Maybe she, I said, we'd like to have you up for dinner. And I think at that point he decided he had wanted to meet Virginia. Toby was very interested in um, ideas, in idea, religious ideas, ideas about painting and history, and uh, a great range of, of interests. Um, and it's true, we had some wonderful conversations. And uh, we'd been talking till about 11 o'clock in the morning, and Art said, maybe we should go out on the deck or into the living room or something. And, and Toby says, oh, no, don't move. You'll break the magic spell. And <laughs> we've often thought of this. Sometimes a, a round-the-table conversation can take on a kind of magic mm -hmm. quality because you're, you're the all concentrating, you're all near each other, you're all in eye contact, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had lots of these kind of magic spell moments in, in conversation. And He took an interest in our house that we were building. He thought of himself as um, an interior designer. Uh -huh. And um, he, he visited one weekend uh, 
And uh, we were just uh, painting and uh, plastering and so on, and he got very interested. As he came in the door, I said, well, I've been waiting for you because we're trying to pick out some uh, paper, to paper the uh, hallway out here. And I uh, said, you might have some ideas of going through this book. He said, I don't need any ideas, and you don't need any paper. He said, this paper to decorate uh, halls, when they're too high, defeats its purpose. If people are not tall enough, the ceiling in that old house over there is about 20 feet high, and it comes into the apex. So you could see there was a great deal of sense as well as artistic thing. Now why figure out paper you can't see? And also he said, the plasterer who did this job was an artist. Look at those marvelous swirls, he called them. <laughs> they don't ever paint those. And I think they're still there, aren't yeah, they? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a bit of education for me. What sort of work was it that Toby wanted you to do for him in the legal field? He telephoned me for a, an appointment to discuss his income tax problems. That case came up in 1961 when the government denied his right to an exemption per year, which I think amounted to $75,000. Uh, of earnings, what was earned. And uh, their argument was if he didn't have a sale, then he didn't have the right to, to uh, make the deduction. Uh, but uh, when the painting was sold after the year he painted it, the question was, well, was this an earning due to that year's labor or was he entitled to it? The second year, the tax court had decided in their language, which I'm partly quoting, that every time Picasso and Toby swing a brush, they're working just as hard as a pencil-pushing lawyer or accountant. <laughs> At one point, he was in uh, New York and then in, uh, in Europe before the Second War. And then he came to this country for several years. Well, he told me one time, and I haven't seen it anywhere else in writing, that when he left the Chicago School of Art, his first job in New York was as a messenger boy for an advertising concern. And when he was delivering, picking up some uh, drawings to take to department stores of dresses of women's clothing that are going to go on show, he said to the supervisor of the department, I can do better than that. Hmm. So his boss pulled out a pad and said, show me. So Toby whipped out the pencil and sketched women's dresses and all this in no time at all. So they gave him a job and he said it almost ruined him as a painter because he was making so much money. Among his things there are, were designs he had done for Martha Graham for both costume and stage uh, uh, sets. And this was all a part of a busy sort of young painter New York scene. Mm -hmm. But uh, he decided I, apparently that he wanted to come west for personal as well as professional reasons and he ended up in Seattle. We were thinking the other day um, about him and uh, the Depression years, and, and like many artists in America, he really was uh, sustained by the WPA program oh, yeah. and did uh, paintings and... Uh, he did murals. Uh, I think so, and he... he um, it was an interesting time. Uh, the Depression uh, had certainly its terrible costs, but in other respects, it, it threw people together with a common uh, interest and occupation. And I think that in Seattle, the WPA artists had a kind of a bond, and I imagine went on talking about it the rest of their lives. Because as you look back in the history of many of the Northwest painters, 
they were sustained through that period by the the, the works progress yeah. program. He left uh, Seattle and went to Dartington Hall, which was a um, very English, a very interesting English institution, whose concept of education was almost identical with uh, Cornish. He uh, was very uh, close to a faculty member there, Bernard Leach, who was an eminent potter and headed up that program of Dartington. And um, the two of them, um, during the 30s, uh, had a wonderful trip to uh, Japan. And um, this was an important part of his life because he stayed on and he did some work in uh, uh, Japanese art in uh, Sumi painting and in the study of uh, a Japanese religious tradition in which he was very interested. He said to me one time, he said, I am capturing rhythm when I throw that Sumi brush, which he said Horiichi and Sudakawa taught me how to use with the uh, Japanese black ink. And he said, when I threw that brush, he said, I combined it with a rhythmic follow-through. You know, he was really quite a musician. Uh, I, I don't know that everybody realizes that, but um, he, uh, when he was at Cornish, he traded painting lessons for piano lessons oh. with uh, uh, Madame Jacobson, who was a, a, a very accomplished teacher and, and musician. And he got interested in composing. He composed for the flute. He composed for the piano. Very creditable works that uh, are, are played in, in concert to this day. He said to me one time, if he had to live his life over again, he would be a musician. He said, he said there's point and counterpoint, balance and rhythm. It's just like painting. This year is his 100th centenary. Therefore, in the 1920s, he was 30. As he got, his, uh, got back to Seattle in 39, as the war broke out, he was 40. So he was just coming into his own with the French Gallery and the Marion Willard Gallery. Uh, doing his own thing. Every two years he changed yeah. in the type of thing he was doing. And he didn't want to repeat and keep doing things even though they sold well. Something else was driving him. And I think as he reached into his 50s, he was stabilized in his own thinking, in his own direction. But at the same time, I go back to the fact that I think he found in Virginia uh, an interesting person to talk to, and uh, he liked uh, the friendship. And I, as I used to remind him, was artistically illiterate, which he said he knew, but he still wanted my ideas on what I thought of his drawings. And because they were so abstract, I found it very difficult. I'd have to say, well, I like the reds and the blues fusing in there. And now one time he came back to the studio from uh, Switzerland. The first thing he would do when I pick him up at the railroad track, he'd want to go right to his studio to see his old friends. He had statuary in there that he could lift up and pat. And he look at his uh, paintings that he thought were unfinished. Uh, three or four, he'd say, what do you think of that one? And um, I said, well, my opinion is if you do anything more to it, you'll ruin it. Uh -huh. we, we said, well, gee whiz, is that right? He says, you better take it. <laughs> hmm. 
I'd like to know more about the paintings that, some of the paintings that were your very favorites in your collection of Toby's. Living with paintings, if, uh, if they speak to you, you really, be, you really get pretty involved with them. And um, so we have uh, quite a few pieces of Toby's that are, are very special. Uh, I think, first of all, of the um, painting page from the Universal, uh, which um, it, uh, is quite a story about, because when he, he had uh, given it to us, and um, it didn't have a title, so we uh, met him in Manning's out in the University District one morning uh, for coffee, and I said to him, uh, Mark, um, that painting doesn't have a title. What do you think it should be called? And um, he said, well, what, what does it suggest to people? Do, do people come up with ideas about what it, what it suggests? And um, I said, oh, any number. They, somebody says it looks like a field of daisies. Somebody says it looks like pebbles in the stream. Somebody said it looks like the Milky Way. And Toby held up his hand. He said, that's enough. We'll call it a page from the Universal. And just how did the critics uh, consider Toby? Toby's feeling about his work was that it's there, I've said it. Now, you do with it what you want to do. I mean, you see what's there. I don't put what you see there. You put what you see there. What effect did uh, your friendship with Toby have on your life? This friendship was a, um, has been a major factor in our life. Um, I, I think uh, often of uh, a comment um, our oldest son made, he came home <clears throat> after his first year away f at college, and um, he was talking about his experience as a freshman, and, and uh, he said, you know, I feel uh, very lucky to have um, been in a home atmosphere where there were paintings that had more than one meaning. He said, uh, the, the paintings that we have, uh, every day you get up and you look at them and you see something new or something different. And he said, um, I kept running into students at uh, college who were looking for the meaning, the answer. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I like the feeling that uh, answers and meanings have to unfold. And I, I think this was, um, if, if an artist has been able to say this, you know, that's, that's an enormous gift. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. and, uh, and I certainly feel that uh, Toby's contribution to our lives and to the life of our family has been very much in this vein.